In studio with the Friday Five, which includes Ken Matson in the Joe Ferretti telephone seat. Ken, you with us via phone? Good morning. Good morning to you, sir. Also in studio, holding over from the first half hour, the Admiral Bill Stubblefield. Billy. Good morning again, Rob. New York Times bestselling author John Gilstrap. Good morning. And added in the 835 break as well, Mr. Mike Carl, the longest tenured member of the crew. Michael. Good morning. And he is uh, the professional uh, agitator in the room. <laughs> People say, does Larry believe half the stuff he says? I said, yeah, he believes half the stuff. Maybe even 60%. Larry, good morning to you. <laughs> yeah, well. Pull, pull that mic closer to you. It's quite a bit. It's uh, it's more than 60. More than 60? Uh, yeah. 61? Oh, well, I'd say quite a bit more than that. Mostly, though, I disbelieve the opposite, if you know what I mean. Oh, I do know what you mean. <laughs> I think at this point, we all know what you mean there. Uh, let's see. Do we want intros this morning? You want to roll right into the program? Take a vote. Hands up if you want an intro. Let's. You worked yeah, one. You worked on them. Two. I, I can. I can make them sit for a week. No. Too. We, we, we're shorter on time. Ken, what do you think? Um, I can see two. I'll be the third one. But yes, do it. And we go a little something like this. Hit it. All right, it's been a week since we got our Friday five in tow, a week with stock market highs and a stock market low. Inflation was feared, reporting in at 3%. Seems higher than that to me, though, once all my money's been spent. Gas prices went higher and diesel for trucks. You can't get a box of cereal at the supermarket for less than six bucks. But that overpriced stuff is still selling. There's still people who bought them. So don't tell people your problems. Half don't care and the others are happy you got them. After a week off, Mike Carl returns with his own horn to toot. He was at his partner's meeting last week, divvying up all that legal loot. It was almost too quiet around this place in Mike's absence. About as quiet as Trump's January 6th response to calls for help from Mike Pence. Good to be back. <laughs> you know who really missed Mike Carl was this guy to my right? With Mike Carl not here, Larry Schultz had no one to fight. He threw a few bombs to get Gilstrap into a conservative versus liberal debate. But John responded, eh, in my next book, I'll just kill off Schultz in Chapter 8. <laughs> Four. Four with that, sir? We'll move it up. Speaking of Gilstrap, last week he was the Lone Ranger, or the Lone Trump Conservative around the table of danger. But he didn't flinch. He didn't, of course. At show's end, he just saddled up and rode off on his high right-wing high horse. <laughs> Welcome back, John. And speaking of horses, nobody knows them so fine as Ken Matson, who's known as the king of the equine. He'll care for your horse, he'll feed them till it fills you. He rides them, he shoes them, and then he bills you. <laughs> Good morning. Speaking of bills, we have one here, too, who speaks the English language with the clarity of Scooby-Doo. <laughs> 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 Unfair if it wasn't true. <laughs> and just like that great, just like that great day, and old Bill's got our backs, unless he's distracted like this week when Maria brought in snacks. <laughs> well, that's our Friday Five, and it shouldn't come as a shock when I say Ken Matson with issue number one. You're now on the clock. All right. Good morning, everybody. Um, I had a couple of uh, subjects online, but everyone kind of crossed over on them. So, I, as a veteran, I'm going to go ahead and throw this one out. Um, during my times during this week, uh, I have a few clients that are military veterans, and um, they wanted my opinion um, on some of the issues recently uh, that Trump has da done. Now, granted, we've always had presidents that um, are questionable in regards to their um, actions, et cetera, to the military. Um, but it's always been a, a, a basically a, a hit back on not supporting the troops. And when we hear of the current candidate who used to be president, um, during his time, he, he yeah, if I say he dodged a giraffe with bone spurs. Um, he said his personal Vietnam was club, not getting an STD at Club 54. Um, there are 58,000 names on a wall in D.C. that would love to have hit the bars during that time. Um, then he disparages John McCain of being a POW. Gold Star families, even though they didn't agree with them, they had a sacrifice. Their son or daughter served and died in a line of duty. They alleged that Putin put bounties on U.S. soldiers, but nothing was said about it. Complained about being in the rain in front of Normandy survivors who stormed that beach, and yet they were under another type of rain called bullets and shrapnel. Then we have, um, there were suckers and losers. What was in it for them? 
And now most recently, where was Nikki Haley's husband? Well, currently he's serving in Africa. So, yes, every president has it, and I will chastise Biden 100% on his debacle in Afghanistan. But I have never heard anyone, any president, before Trump and Biden, disparage the military in such a way. Do we need somebody like this, or should the right wing, my party, leaders who support the military, correct this issue on Donald Trump? Go ahead. Thank you, Ken. Good job uh, kicking off the program here. we got a couple of veterans in studio. Let's start first with the more higher-ranking one, the Admiral Bill Stubblefield. Uh, yeah. Uh, what, our, you what, by no. many levels. <laughs> no, no. Uh, I was at E5. <laughs> yeah. uh, Ken, I, I agree with you. I think it's appalling that we take shots at veterans. Uh, if you serve for one year or if you serve for 42 years, you still put duty before a duty for country before yourself uh a lot of us saw this up close and personal with veterans coming back from vietnam how much it stung how much the service of one's country to one's country was diminished and and ignored uh i find it appalling uh I my sense though that it's not resonating with a lot of people. Uh, Trump made that famous statement several years ago that I could walk down Fifth Avenue and shoot somebody and nobody would hold it against me. Uh, I'm beginning to think that statement was true. Uh, unfortunately, there's not the reaction to the uh, criticism of veterans as I would like to think they would be and like to think they should be. Mr. Carl, well I mostly agree with what the admiral said uh i have a problem with you know a lot of things trump has said in the, along those lines but i really and and i you know i wish we had a good alternative and our party has some <laughs> but but uh i don't uh I, trump is is just a a, a visceral uh, and I don't mean, think this means that he really doesn't respect the military. He 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 just makes statements and takes shots, uh, not because he's you know inherently anti-military, but he doesn't you know he, what he says and the way he operates does not show enough respect. And I so I agree it, it, it's it's a problem, but but uh, the. Uh, you know, there's, it's even worse are these neo isolationists that many of whom aren't as concerned about the military and particularly the ones overseas as they ought to be. Mr. Gilstrap. <clears throat> we have to understand, and I'm not going to defend anything that, that, that Trump said because it's, it's sort of indefensible, but let's, let's think about what is baked into the Donald Trump cake or the cake that is Donald Trump. He's a bloviating gas bag. He says he's completely transactional um, in the sense that if he gets his feelings hurt, John McCain opposed him in political issues. So John McCain became a bum or a coward, whatever it was, you know, losers go to prison, whatever it was that he, he says, you can't, you can't justify those words coming from anybody. And the fact that it it hammers a veteran, quite honestly, is no different than if, if it hammers anybody else. I mean, the veterans are kind of a protected class in, in terms of respect, as in the respect that they have earned. But Trump is an ecumenical insulter. You know, he just, he, he if you're in his way, he will insult. But let's look at the record. Um, while he was president, he completely rebuilt the United States military. He did not start another war. That was nice, the first president in quite some time. Secured three pay raises for service members and their families. Established a space force, was the first branch, new branch of the United States Armed Forces since 1947. We can argue the, the wisdom of that, but it, it's, it, it was at least a focus on the military. Modernized and recapitalized nuclear forces with missile defenses to ensure that they continue to be a strong deterrent. Our missile defense capability right now, our entire arsenal is suffering, but at that point, our, our nuclear defenses were getting pretty rusty. He upgraded cyber defenses by elevating cyber command into a major war fighting command that had never been done before. It used to be part of space command in the, in the Air Force. Now it is a combi combatant command with its own four-star leadership. Um, you know, he, he destroyed the, the caliphate. 
you know, completely wiped out the ISIS caliphate. So if we're going to judge a man based on the, the gas baggy words he uses, or are we going to judge a man by the by the actions he actually takes against pushback from the other party. I'm, I'm not an apologist for Donald Trump's mouth, but I think we have to recognize that this is not, re this, his, his words do not necessarily reflect an active, uh, a practical uh, disrespect, but it certainly reflects a, uh, an audible disrespect. So don't judge a man by his words, judge him by his actions is what you're saying. Yes. Mr. Schultz. Sure. One of his actions that I'll be happy to judge him by is a worship in public, not of military <laughs> veterans, but of Vladimir Putin. And they, they have done everything they can. They're now denying the Republican parties, denying aid to Ukraine, stopping it in the House, making uh, him stronger. Uh, does Donald Trump balance that in any way by suggesting to Putin, don't think for a minute you're taking a step into another NATO country. You're not going into Poland. He doesn't do that. What he says instead is, if they don't pay their bills, I will call them up and tell them do whatever the hell he wants. Um, yeah, I don't understand how there's a difference between what a man says he believes and some other set of events that cause you to think that, well, maybe he doesn't really believe that, and he's just bloviating. So do you think that Biden actually believes that Mexico shares a border with Gaza? Or was... was no, any more than Nikki Haley shares an identity man, with, with Pelosi. You said we have to take a man at his word. I'm just saying, is, is, is that what you actually no, believe? No, he I'm made a mistake. With my left hand. Just like... Uh, your uh, your candidate made a mistake for about five minutes mentioning Nikki Haley's name about five or ten times when he meant Nancy Pelosi, who he's not running against. Uh, so, look, uh, there are those issues on both of these sides, but only one guy doesn't care about our enlisted people. It, you can say, we'll build up the military without respecting the veterans and you know a lot of veterans who we know are no longer in the military to call them suckers and losers and to kiss up to the biggest enemy our nation has vladimir putin is really troubling and in the end you think unlike joe biden uh who um had a a, a son who was in combat um Unlike Joe Biden, we may find that jo that Donald Trump just doesn't care. It's not going to affect his family if we go to war over a Putin invasion of Poland. And if it doesn't affect his family, he's shown us time and time again, he doesn't care about it. Comes back to you, Kenny. Um, every every administration, every year of Congress, they always do something for the military, pay raises, etc. They could do more in regards to veterans, uh, the VA course that's always been an issue but we come down to this everybody on this panel pretty much agrees you didn't disparage the the military and i think we've shown more courage on standing up to that type of talk than our leaders in dc and i think they should do the same you can agree with the guy he was the greatest thing whatever it's all your personal opinion but when someone says something bad have the spine have the cojones to stand up to it that's all so uh, to add to this issue and going around the room, my, my question to build off of what Ken's premise was, in the past, if you had a candidate who was saying things, even if you liked the candidate, uh, that were outrageous or over the top and insulting people who otherwise we wouldn't be insulting, that candidate's own base would get a hold of that candidate and say, you know, you kind of need to backtrack on this one. You, you need to go back. The Trump base, I think we can agree, has a very large patriotic contingent that was pro-military and was pro-police. Right? And Mike Carl just raised his hand. Yeah. Right? And they were very, that's a very patriotic, red, white, and blue, Chevy trucks, hot dogs, commercial during baseball game uh, base. But for whatever reason, 
this base continues to applaud this guy when he says these things publicly. They don't groan in public when he says these things. There's no groaning going on at his rallies. It's fervent applause and, 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 and over-the-top adulation. And this puzzles the hell out of me because I don't understand where that's coming from because they should be groaning at some of the things that he says. It goes against everything that they previously believed. Rob, what what we're hearing, Rob, is from a very vocal, very supportive segment uh, on both sides of the, of the fence. Where this is going to come down, where it makes a difference, is in the general election, where the bunch of moderates uh, that are not particularly vocal are going to express their feelings one way or the other. I think statements such as this is going to work against the, lar- the large swath of folks in the middle. But we'll find out come November. Right, and I get that as far as the general election goes. But in regards to what he's doing right now, I, I don't understand. In the past, if you didn't like something that your candidate said, you just stayed quiet. Maybe or you just, you know, maybe there was, like I said, a groan in the crowd when somebody would say something. But this it doesn't happen at his rallies. And you can say, well, Biden's worse about the economy and inflation and the country sucks and the border. Okay, then if that's great. That's fine. I get that. I get that Biden is not the good alternative to Trump. I understand that. But it still doesn't make sense that even though you don't approve of Biden, you still applaud when Trump insults veterans. No, explain uh, that to me. Yeah, I just don't get it. His, his his rallies. That's exactly right. But I do not think the country as a whole they're applauding when he insults veterans. And 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 this whole thing about rallies. I mean, that's just emotional, superficial crap. What matters, and Bill's absolutely right, is what serious people think. And believe, and and recognize what Trump, when he was president, did, and 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 and, and you know, and, and I, 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 I understand. There's a, there's a big distinction between you know substance and this superficial, but but my cheering and rallies are are visceral re, visceral reactions. The the, the 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 candidate says something pro-American, and people who are already at the rallies are excited already. They're yeah, I'm pro-America. I, it, no, I, it doesn't make any sense I, to me I, that, I, that those I, people I, react this I, way. I couldn't criticize those people who are, you know, cheering for anti-military uh, uh, and anti-American, as far as I'm concerned, uh, comments that Trump, you know, stupidly comes out with once in a while. I've never been to a rally. I would never go to a rally. It's not my kind of thing. I don't like crowds, crowds all that much. But having said that, I'm going to, again, I'm not an apologist for any of this, but do you really want to be the one guy who goes boo in the middle of a bunch of folks who are going yay, you know, at, at, a, at a place like that? I think it, there's a certain degree of if, if group Trump, cowardice. If Trump is insulting veterans at a rally that I'm attending, you, you am, I gonna go, am I going to go yay? Well, no. I, and I don't know that that's how it happens, they actually. That's what you I, talked about. I, I, know that, I, I know that he says these things in... I, again, I'm not going to be an, an apologist for him, but I, I do think that the I don't know a single Trump supporter who doesn't pray to all things holy that he will break his phone and put down his Twitter feed and that he yeah. would actually stick to a script and that he would allow his record to speak for itself as opposed to running his mouth and and, and doing the stuff he does. He's an inarticulate man. Uh, and I think, like I said, I think that's baked into into the cake. I find it annoying as hell, uh, just simply because that becomes what's discussed instead of the substance of things. And he brings it on himself. I agree, but I, but, I, I have but to keep repeating myself, but I just don't understand how I've never his, heard his I, base goes against their core values yeah. when he says stuff that but, doesn't... But the, I, the base I, he needs, as Bill would point out, are the ones that vote in the general election. These psychos that show yeah. up at these rallies, I've never been one either, <laughs> uh, you know, that that's meaningless. It's just... It just but, should show. But I disagree with John Gilstrap to some degree. Right. There's a 15 to 20 percent group that do not want him to tear up his telephone, that <laughs> feed upon his Twitter feeds or his comments on social media, and they, they're the ones agging him on. What we're not talking about very much, if we had an MSNBC 
rebuttal to it, they're just as strong to the, to the other side as what Fox News or his social media account is on in support of him. You know, the one time I did hear Trump get booed, and Chris brought this up on our on our uh, online feed, when he told about everybody to get the vaccine, not about veterans, but get the vaccine, and he was booed at one of his rallies. And on that note, while John Gilstrap trashes the place, <laughs> we break. Bill's on the clock. Ken Matson is in the Joe Ferretti chair, and that chair literally is at his house or perhaps outside the barn. Ken, good morning. Thanks for being with us by phone. Good morning. Definitely inside, keeping warm. Yeah, baby. That's a smart thing to do there, too. Mr. Lawrence Schultz, attorney at law. Great to be here. Great to have you. Larry, Larry's always the last to put his headphones on like he's surprised we're doing a show while he's sitting here having a conversation. Like, oh, is that what we're doing? We're actually doing a show here? I thought we were just shooting it, you know? Uh, also, uh, Mr. John Gilstrap, New York Times bestselling author. Good morning. The senior member of our crew, Mike O'Carroll. Good morning, everybody. And with issue number two, the Admiral, Bill Stubblefield. Billy? Uh, good morning, Rob. Uh, this past week, there was an election in N Nassau County, New York, uh, to replace George Santos, which had been expelled from Congress. Uh, this is interesting and because of the locality and the trend of the state. It has historically been a, uh, a blue, st uh, blue district. More recently, though, it's been trending to the red. So it could conceivably be called a, a purple district, I think. Uh, they had a well-qualified candidate, both Democrat and Republican. What makes this interesting though in my mind uh, it would be the platforms which they both ran on the democrats instead of trying to be defensive on border security took border security head on and made it as their principal issue and the argument was we need and this was after shortly after the republicans had refused to uh, uh to pass it through the senate uh which needed 60 votes and the house had already said they would not pick up this border security bill uh so but the democrat took it on and said we have to have border security we have to do something about our immigration and we need to do it in a bipartisan, collective, uh, corporate uh, way. Uh, the Republican, on the other hand, took the other position and took the Republican in, uh, in D.C.'s position. We didn't get everything we want. Therefore, I'm not going to support it. The result of this was a much larger difference in election the democratic won he won by nearly eight or nine percentage points everybody thought it was going to be a very very close race was it strictly a function or product of the the platform border security i don't know but i suspected that had a lot to do with it my question is is this going to be what we will see in the fall that the democrats will run on border security that we have to do something about it or will the Republicans keep their position they have now that if we cannot get everything, we're not going to support anything? All right, so this was a one-off or not, Michael Carl? Well, uh, the, the, all this, you know, congressional legislative gamesmanship of, you know, this is in there, this is in, we're playing, you know, it, 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 that's all just superficial political process. The, the basic fact of the truth of the matter is that Joe Biden undid a lot of Trump's border policies and has failed to do his job under current law and all this gamesmanship about, uh, you know, change this program, do that, do that. that, that that's just gamesmanship. The political significance, the greatest political significance is that Joe Biden has intentionally failed to do his job, and that's why we have a border crisis. Mr. Schultz. James Lankford, one of the most conservative people ever to serve in the United States Senate, perhaps, wrote a bill with help from a lot of people on the Republican side uh, to fix permanently, not with executive orders that can change when you change presidents, but with a law that will uh, that will be in place and set forth the policy of the U.S. He set that up. He had the approval of the Senate. He had the approval of a lot of the House. And then, um, and this is why what Donald Trump says is important, He could, Trump comes along and kills the deal. And the reason... 
He killed the deal. They said the quiet part out loud. We don't want Joe Biden to get the credit for this. They actually said it. A couple of Republican congressmen actually said it. So either the border is a problem, in which case you had a golden opportunity to start fixing that problem, or it's not. If it is a problem and you don't fix it, then I got to think you're lying when you say it's a problem. The way to fix the problem is to get rid of the president who's not doing his job. <laughs> you could, you, that's not what Lankford thought. Lankford thought, and the whole Republican caucus was with him for a while, that a new law was important. And they wrote one, and it was sweeping, and it was important. And then all of a sudden it wasn't important anymore because the MAGA guy, who, you know, we're going to just ignore what he says. This was something he said, and he killed the bill. He killed it. That's why having him as president is not going to be a box of chocolates next time. Mr. Gilstrap. Oh, the hypocrisy. Um, <laughs> four years ago, three years ago, when, when Joe Biden came into office and he destroyed the, the, he, the, the border policy of the United States, he did it with a pen. It's easy enough to do with a pen. It's easy enough to undo with a pen. Joe Manchin on this show said guilty as charged. Joe Manchin absolutely, by God, killed our border security. He owns it as as a Democrat. Shelley Moore Capito, who was on board and then not on board, said that she heard from so many of her constituents that this is a bad idea representing the constituency. She voted against it. I won't speak to their hearts because I'm not their, those people. From a purely political standpoint, cold politics. And this the crisis has only gotten worse and is only a crisis because it's affecting Democratic uh, states. It was never a crisis in the mind of Democrats when it was strictly the Republican southern border that was was being invaded. Now that that Abbott and um, DeSantis are shipping their uh, as as chattel, by the way, I mean, it's a horrific thing that's going on. But it's the only solution is to is to is to share the misfortune. So now there's there's the drumbeat of of we've got to close the border. Everybody now is united in the idea that we have to fix what Joe Biden broke. For the life of me, from a political point of view, I can't understand why the Republicans would give Biden any political cover for fixing the border right now. I mean, it's, and you're going to talk, you're going to say something about dead babies. I know that. So, well, it, but but the the. This is a political year, and if Biden really wants, he said, you pass this bill, I will close the border on day one. He can close the border right now, and he's choosing not to because he is trying to get political cover. He's not. He doesn't know what's going on, but his, his people are trying to get political cover to to make him look less like the disaster of a president that he is. And I think it's wonderful that the Republicans didn't blink. For once, the Republicans didn't blink. The Democrats had three years to fix this, and they chose not to. Good, Larry. You're just jumping. Uh, for a good bit of that time, the Republicans controlled the House. They still control the House now. And they are now saying, uh, yeah, 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 we want that border bill. And then all of a sudden, there's the border bill, and no. Joe Biden will get credit. We can't possibly do that. You don't care very much about those uh, young children dying on the border if you're willing to play it off like that. You haven't Here's cared for the three thing. years. If you put, yeah, well, I wasn't in the Congress like the Republican you, you. Party was. It's... I wasn't in the Congress pushing for a border bill. That's all they talk about. And then when it was handed to them on a silver platter, oh no, somebody else other than us will get credit. By the way, if Joe Biden goes back and writes a bunch of executive orders and fixes the border, it's not going to fix anything. He just has to do his next, job under the, current law. The next person who comes along as president can sign new executive orders that change it all. That's not how we govern the United States of America. We pass laws and we follow them. So when if if Donald Trump wins and there <clears throat> excuse me and there's a Democratic Congress you think the Democrats are going to line up for the a border bill proposed by Republicans and say, yes, let's go ahead and give the W to the R's? 
That ain't going to happen. A good it number so of them fo- did just now, the, and they the, wouldn't give Biden the win. A pox, okay. on, a pox on all their houses. Congress is so dysfunctional. Nobody, we don't matter anymore to, the, to people in Washington. We stopped mat- mattering a long time ago. I mean, that's the... the well, you can't blame Congress. Trump drove that. He no, drove that, no, that no, walk no. away. Obama drove it before Trump, and Biden is driving it they now. They had a bill, and it's, Trump killed it. Kenny Matson. Kenny Matson. All right, I'll try to calm things down. Well, John Gilstrap almost basically proved the point, you know, um, make it a law, right? So we've had Democrats who had total control of Congress. We had Republicans in total control of Congress. And where was the border bill, right? So we can't govern on executive orders. And again, we said this ad nauseum uh, many shows ago. We're not a dictatorship. We run by laws, not executive orders. Not a king who decides on a whim, oh, you know what, I'm going to go ahead and do this. No, we are a set of laws. We finally had some patriotic people come together and make a bill, make a law to follow, not just executive orders, but a law, or I'm going to make it poor, laws, to help fix our border problem. And because the one person, because they don't have an economy to run on now because that's doing – pretty good and he's taking credit for it now so that, that's off the table so again what well we have you know babies dying at the border okay sure let's, let's wait for the next administration so how many more people are going to die from fentanyl drug, you know being pushed in here in the united states from china through mexico how many criminals are going to come across the border coming up to new york beating up cops um supposed alleged terrorist cells that are coming through our border how long are we going to allow this because we don't want one person to win or, oh, it's going to look good for, you know, Biden or insert Democrat here. When will, and it's been said already, when will we finally do country before party? If it's party, you can go over to Russia and have fun over there. And we already know what happened to political people who don't agree with Putin. Navalny just passed away this morning. So go ahead, have fun over there. But we are a set of laws and a democracy. Come together come with it they finally did and one person said no and they all just bended knee now as i said it's both sides have done this right but now we had a couple people would come together and finally pass a bill i'm sorry put forth the bill that's what we need stop doing executive orders and become law thank you the uh, program 60 minutes which would never be conserved uh, con- uh, confused with a conservative rag uh Three weeks ago, I believe, did a feature on the border, and they showed a a hole under the fence and the razor wire cut along the Mexican border where I think they said it was about 6,000 a week were coming through that hole. There's a Border Patrol agent standing right there who's not permitted to stop them. John Gilstrap pointed out to me when I was discussing this story that that's policy. That's not a law. That's policy. Uh, That policy is in effect courtesy of the president. He stands there while 6,000 a week go through that hole in the fence and then they walk along the property line until they're eventually picked up by a border patrol agent or a van hauls a bunch of them to a processing center or whatever. That property where they cut underneath the fence is owned by a person in California who owns 60, 70 acres along the border. Uh, These folks with nowhere else to go uh, pitch a tent and once they eventually make their way along the processing, uh, leave their tent and litter behind on this guy's property. Uh, enough of them are there gathered that they cut down trees at night on his property to stay warm and burn the wood to stay warm. When he went down there to try to get people to stop littering his property and cutting down his trees, he was accosted to the point where he needed to retreat to his home where he got a shotgun. And he fired the shotgun in the air at which point California's authorities arrested him for discharging his firearm, confiscated his gun, and threw him in jail. This is what's going along along, along the border. Now, how do these people know about the hole in the fence? TikTok. And it shows them exactly, step by step, how to get to the hole in the fence, who to contact to transport them to the hole in the fence. There's a whole industry set up where people in pickup trucks cart these people along like cattle to the hole in the fence where they go through it in an orderly fashion right in front of the Border Patrol agent who's not allowed to stop them. Now, that part could be stopped by the signature of a pen. That wouldn't need legislation. That's policy. 
Is the legislation messed up? Do we need a much better immigration reform bill? Correct. But you can plug a leak sometimes, too. That also helps stop the water coming into your house. And there's a leak that could be plugged with a signature from the president, and he has not done it. Bill, you get the final word. Here. Yeah, uh, two two things. One, my question was not the uh, of the border policy itself. My question or issue was, will this play into this fall's elections? Will it become a major part? Not a single person picked up on that. <laughs> okay, but the other thing about uh, uh, can the president – close the border or fix a problem there are two schools of thought of it it is a wonderful soundbite it is a beautiful soundbite the president can do it himself well the supreme court has said he cannot do it himself there's only one nationality one religious group that the supreme court says he can close the border you to. cite the case cite the case come on michael let me finish will you please and it's the muslims that uh, that uh, supreme court ruled on uh, with with donald trump uh so there's only one national or one religious group that the Supreme Court says he can do it. Uh, and the other thing is uh, to keep him in Mexico, that requires an agreement with the Mexican uh, government. They had it at one time, and because Trump had a tariff that he was he was going to threaten them with, and the, uh, the Mexican government agreed with it. But my basic premise, will it be come into play in elections in the fall? I would say yes, in every election it's going to come into play. And you can interpret the issue any way you want to in the fall. Issue number three, Mr. Gilstrap. <clears throat> well, lighten it up a little bit here. Um, I start now. <laughs> <laughs> Bill, Bill and his good friend Mike were about to come to blows there. I know, I know. <laughs> he is my good friend. <laughs> I, 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 I was, I was going to bring up a gun issue, but I thought I'd go a different way. Um, in, You're not going the stud machine route, are you? Yeah, no, I'm not. I'm not. I'm trying to. I'm trying to. There's a soul train kind of stud machine thing in my head here for the for the jingle. Um, in in California, there's there's a race for Diane Feinstein's Feinstein's uh, spot. She recently passed away, and among the candidates for this senatorial spot is is a, a, a lady named Barbara Lee who is, with her facial noisemaker, suggesting that there be a $50 minimum wage to be paid uh, for, for workers because that is what is considered to be a survivable amount. Now, I don't want to go too far out over my skis here and say that we would all think that $50 minimum wage is a bit high. If you want to argue otherwise, I, I think that's great. My question is, does the absurdity, in my mind, of that number expose the absurdity of inflating minimum wage across the board. We decide that it is $17, $25, pick a number, whatever it is, all that does is make everything more expensive, right? Or assuming, as she does in her justification and following up on, on the suggestion, it, it costs an extraordinary amount of money to live in San Francisco. So in order to, uh, the minimum wage, starting wage, Sweeping floors, starting wage of $50 allows people to have a livable lifestyle in San Francisco, and therefore that, that should be the number. Whether you want to address the, the specific number or not, up to you. What I really want to talk about is, is a stab, elevating minimum wages. Is, is it a, an exercise in folly, or is it something that actually is necessary? Mike, we've had this discussion before. I'll bring it up with you right now. Well, I, uh, I can't remember this, this discussion that you're referring to, but I, I, I will say something. The, the minimum wage concept is, a, is just a major, major exception to the free enterprise system. And the free enterprise system is why America is the greatest country in the world and why we're the most comfortable and wealthiest country in the world on a mass basis. And so this all, I, I, I think this proposal raises a question about the very concept of, of the efficacy of a minimum wage, which is, a, again, a major exception and, and, you know, alteration and move away from the free enterprise system. Uh, employers will pay what they need to pay to people who are capable of doing the work they need to be done. That's what 
wages ought to be based on, and the and the minimum wage is a, is a violation of that principle, and that's why we have these crazy proposal about fifty dollars an hour. And and by the way, fifty dollars an hour is one hundred and four thousand dollars a year, and you cannot live in San Francisco on one hundred and four thousand right. dollars a year. It's not enough. It's still not enough. <laughs> right. Bill Stubblefield. Yeah, uh, that fifty dollars a. Uh, uh, an hour is just a figment of someone's imagination. It will never get any real traction. I don't care where you are. But that's not your point, uh, John. Uh, the reason we have a minimum wage uh, is, and I agree with Mike Carl on a lot of things, uh, our ca- uh, capitalistic system is the free market is the way it should go. But there are there are uh, examples, many examples, that someone has taken advantage of it and have, have abused. We hear these stories uh, throughout our history of folks working way, way below the poverty level. Uh, should we resort strictly upon the, uh, the, uh, our uh, free market? With accepting that there will be abuses, uh, that's the question that we've had for quite a while. I think there needs to be some protection for these abuses that we've had, the the kind of the labor camps, if you will. But I I think it's a a very slippery slope. I think it needs to be done in moderation. Mr. Schultz. Yeah. um, (laughs) The candidate in this uh, uh, Senate uh, race who made that proposal is running forth, will finish forth, and is not a uh, credible person who's going to become a member of the U.S. Senate. So it's more likely that um, uh, some retired West Virginia, Joe Manchin will move to California and become a senator from California uh, than that Barbara Lee will become a senator. So... It's, uh, it raises the issue of whether uh, minimum wages do anything, but in a nation where the union movement has been killed and workers can't agitate on their own uh, with uh, their group uh, to uh, get protection, um, you, you don't want to trust your life uh, to the goodwill of American capitalists. Because the only people whose goodwill they're interested in, like Donald Trump, interestingly enough, is their own. And so they're not going to make your life fabulous uh, or give you a way to to scramble by. I, I would also add, you know, when the food prices shot up in the wake of COVID and we were told that gasoline was over $4 a gallon, and now we we have to have these higher food prices, or you you'll make sure you can't uh, produce or ship the the food. The prices have come down into the twos now, recently back up a little over three, and those food prices have remained pretty high. How about that? How about that? <laughs> um, we need one of the things we need. And I don't hear anybody on either side talking about it. Is some big time antitrust work? We always hear about the free market. A free market doesn't work like this. A free market doesn't keep the price of butter at six bucks a pound when there are other people not in a cabal who will say, hey, I just want to make money. I'm charging five. That's how the free market works. There's an awful lot of price uh, fixing going on. And we need somebody um, and a number of them uh, to get together and, and propose a bill get the bill ready to pass, not have Donald Trump kill the bill, and we need to pass this bill and uh, to Im- improve our antitrust. So that would take some of the pressure off of this desperation of needing a much higher minimum wage. Kenny Matson. Well, if it was in California, I can understand it. Um, it's, as everyone said here right now, it's, I have an, uh, a niece that lives over there, and it's, you know, 140 over there is is pretty much apartment, you know, salary. And over here, $140,000 a year, you can get a pretty good house with probably five acres plus. You know, of course, you have a mortgage payment, but you can live pretty well. Um, I think this was just a statement, considering where she is in the polls, just to get some attention, um, as most people who are running for office do. 
it's not going to go anywhere. It's not really serious. Um, you can't put a fifty dollar minimum wage federally on every on everywhere. It's just not going to happen. You're going to close down businesses. You're going to have conglomerates. You're going to have you know someone just cornering the market in regards to certain businesses uh, that do have the capital to be able to withstand it, uh, quote unquote capital. Um, but it's 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 not going to happen. As I said, I think just rhetoric. Um, but, you know, Larry does bring up a point in regards to, you know, everything's still going up. Well, why? Right. So profit. Every, hey, we're a capitalist society. We're about profit. But now what we're recently about shrinkflation. Right. I saw it with my bag of Doritos for the Super Bowl. Right. How many times do you see our, 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 our chocolate bars getting thinner and thinner and they cost even more? Right. So, yeah, of course, things go up in wages, but still, um, you're, you're, you're getting you're getting less for your money, and I think we got to get back to how much can I get for my money. You make it you make your consumer happy. You're going to continue to buy from them and not start you know nickeling and dime them on the necessities. So I know it's kind of going off the reservation in regards to the fifty dollar thing, but I think it's going nowhere. I think it's just a political ploy. Well, the gasoline shortage was a farce. There was no gasoline shortage. There was never a single day when there was a gasoline shortage. I'm not sure why they drove the price of gasoline up other than the fact that people are speculating on the futures market. There wasn't a day when we went to odd even rationing for gasoline. There wasn't a day when there was a line at a gas station because a pump ran out. That never occurred. There was. It was a farce. There was an absolutely artificial reason to jack up prices and screw people. And they still do it. You got a, I just got a text last week. Someone who's in Hampshire County paying two eighty seven nine for a gallon of gas came to Martinsburg. It was three nineteen. They shouldn't have been, they should have been happy it was three nineteen because the next day it jacked up to three thirty nine. Why? Twenty cents overnight? For what reason? And the other thing that's at, fascinates me about this is apparently everybody who sells gasoline has the exact same cost of doing business. Because when it's three thirty nine nine at one station, it's three thirty nine nine at all of them. They all pay the same wage, pay the same utility bill, pay the exact same cost for everything inside the store. It's amazing to me that they all have the same exact cost of doing business. But this nobody is, can be three thirty eight nine. But this is free market. The only control, doesn't seem free. I know, but that's a, the result of free market. The only control that the federal government has on the gasoline price are, is the strategic reserve. They can pull out mm -hmm. of the strategic reserve, but other than that, they have little. Or no influence on well, I didn't blame the gasoline. federal government yeah. for it in the, in the least. Final work is back to you, John. <clears throat> I think, well, in terms of, of free enterprise system of gasoline in particular, have you ever watched where I used to live in Fairfax, there were gas stations on opposite corners, and the downward pressure on mm -hmm. on prices was amazing. They look at each other and then, you know, kind of and race that, each other to that the is bottom. Gone now. And well, it, it was it was good for the mm -hmm. consumer. But I want to get back to the minimum wage thing. And the reason I, I brought this up is that any form of, and it's sort of, it's socialist with a, with a lowercase s here, uh, any false value that's put on a, a labor force is fundamentally problematic. A minimum wage is a minimum wage. That's what a teenager is going to get when he or she start sweeping floors at McDonald's or flopping burgers. I have no idea what those jobs pay. It's been a very long time. I know that it paid two fifty dollars when, when, uh, when I was that age. Uh, the idea of a minimum wage is to earn your way out of it. So I don't think the idea, this notion, this political notion that people can't raise a family of four on minimum wage, well, no kidding. You know, you're not, that's, that's not what that job is for. Minimum wage is to come in, you learn, you get promoted, you go get another job, and then you come back, you know, whatever the case may be. But I think the notion of minimum wage at the basic level, 750 or whatever is, is the number. It's 875 in West Virginia. 875. Okay, fine. 725 it's, in Pennsylvania. There's, there's a tipping point, because I used to own a company. There's a tipping point where, you know what? The machine that will never call in sick is cheaper. It will pay for itself in 10 years or 15 years. So I'll just do away with that job. That's fundamentally a problem. In, 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 an, in an economy. So I just, I think it was funny, the, the Barbara Lee $50 an hour thing. Of course, it, it's, it's never going to fly. But I think we need to think overall in terms of the wisdom of minimum wages and the inflating in minimum wages. Uh -huh. We're going to go out on that break. Larry, you're on the clock. Larry, you're on the clock. Yes. Uh, I had a bonus question regarding um, the indictment of Alexander Smirnov. Um, as far as I can tell, it's spelled the same way as uh, as the vodka. 
he's the he was the centerpiece of the uh, Republican congressman's or Congress's impeachment of Joe Biden because he had all this fabulous information to provide regarding corruption by Hunter Biden, money flowing to Joe Biden. And now all of that material is the subject of Mr. Smirnoff having been indicted by the feds. This guy, in fact, the same special prosecutor who indicted Hunter Biden on tax charges rather than this whole laundry list of complaints that uh, Congressman Comer's been telling us, uh, Com- Comer has been telling us about for two years. Turns out none of that was true enough to go forward. And in fact, it's such a provable lie that they've now indicted the informant. Um, it's just astonishing to me the amount of time they have wasted with this nonsense. So what is your question here, Larry? The, the question is, uh, is there someone here who, who wants to defend this ridiculous uh, waste of taxpayer time and money? All right, let's uh, go to two people who potentially could, and I'll start first with Mr. Gilstrap. <clears throat> I, I, th- this focuses on, on a healthy thing, actually. Confidential informants and unnamed sources all share one thing. And that is they have an agenda, which means that they rarely, they very often do not tell the truth. They tell truthy truths. And people will tend to glom on to the the lie that forwards their own agenda. And and they'll run with it, whether it's in journalism or whether it's in uh, confidential informants. Given that this is a a criminal... uh, trial or criminal charges were, that came from this and assuming, you know, I don't see the evidence, but I have no reason to doubt it. Assuming that this guy actually did lie, he should be buried under the prison. Mr. Carl. Well, uh, an indictment is a charge. Uh, that's why we have the, you know, the system we have. So, uh, but, but e- even if he's convicted and, and, and everything he was doing, you know, they're, they're claiming he was doing and lying about, uh, is, is confirmed, uh, but that hadn't happened yet. But even if that happens, uh, that doesn't change the absolute fact that Joe Biden is a corrupt influence pl- peddler for decades. We're going to just say that without any proof at all? <laughs> without any proof? <laughs> the, the, pr- the proof of the big guy, the millions of dollars that have never been denied, uh, that 